Um, well, um, first of all, good morning, everybody. I'm so happy to be here. I've been waiting this day for so long now. Um, so, yeah, we come from the University of Florida. Um, we are a Casona team. Um, my name is uh, Jeronimo Chichuri. Um, I'm a fourth year civil engineering student. Um, let me let, let me introduce my my team. Hi guys, I'm Samantha Perez. I am a senior graduating at the University of Florida in civil engineering. I specialize mostly in construction, so I like to be out there with my hard hat building stuff. Um, Hi everybody, my name is Yuslady Vasquez and I'm a second year civil engineering student. Hello everyone, um, my name is Juan Carreras and I'm a mechanical engineer fourth year. Um, initially, it was hard to uh, work with civil engineers in an infrastructure <laughs> challenge, but um, it became easier. <laughs> so next slide. Um, okay, so um, this, the goal that we have for, for this morning, it's, it's very hard. We have 15 minutes and we want you uh, the entire audience to experience what we f like what we experience um, during this research. So um, the way we're going to do it is like answering questions. You know, um, we want to to question like to to give a question and give an answer. So you get the same feeling as we were uh, experiencing once um, we were uh, doing the entire research, and then that led us to the conclusion. Um, so um, um, first of all. Um, we have like an intro, like an introduction of why we are uh, working with hurricanes and what's the importance of it. Um, then we have an alternative analysis section where we like we actually look at everything that could be uh, possible to build, and then we um, just assign what's the best for for constructing. Um, then we're going to present our proposed like project, like the design. We're going to uh, talk about the specifics. Um, then um, we're going to say some of the results, and then we're going to uh, end with conclusions. Um, so this is the first question, and I think this is very important to answer. I didn't know like the answer of this until I started doing research. Um, along the entire process, um, this answer was changing a little bit like every time. Um, so what's an infrastructure challenge? Um, that's a tough question, and I think you should all ask yourself that question. Um, so as I, as I see it, and my team sees it, it's a, a barrier that it's kind of like holding back development. Um, if you, as long as you don't overpass this barrier, you're, you're going to be having issues with development. So the importance is that you work smart, that you are like hard working, and so you could overpass this barrier and um, move like with development. Um, Cuba has infrastructure challenge, but the U.S. has it, China has it, India has it. Every single country in the world has an infrastructure challenge. Like sometimes bigger, sometimes smaller, sometimes they have better resources. Um, but at the end of the day, um, the challenge is good because the challenge enhanced development. You had to be like working the entire country together. You had to be like the, unite the people so you can overcome these difficulties. So um, yeah, this like another question that kind of like came up. Why why do we research? Like, what's the importance of research? And research um, research should be like very theoretical, but then the research goes to to. They, they bring, it brings you to the country. So you need to find the best way um, of constructing in the country. So you need to see whatever is available and then use it the most efficient way that you could, that you could possibly do it. Um, and for our, for our team, what we thought it was very important um, is because like, sometimes the infrastructure challenges, it's a matter of like, investment. Um, but ours in, in specific, it's about weather. You cannot control when you're going to have a hurricane. You cannot do anything about it. The best, the best thing you can do is be smart and prepare for it. So um, what we were concerned about is the immediate um, like protection of lives. Uh, we want to keep the people alive. We don't want anything to happen to the Cubans. So that's why like, our research came about to be this topic. And that's why we are passionate about helping the people to to be resilient. And that's something that 
the definition of resilience is gonna change a little bit. I'm gonna talk about uh, resilience in the end. Um, when I was talking to the mentor, we were talking to a mentor, I personally didn't know what resilience was. I mean, I'm not a native English speaker, so I said like resilience, I don't understand it. And then the first answer was like resilience is kind of building a house that will withstand the, a hurricane that will be up there after the hurricane has passed. Um, that was the first answer. But in the conclusion, I'm gonna say um, what resilience is for me um, and what we came up with the conclusion of what resilience is. Then you lady is gonna talk, talk about the... All right, bit. so the second question we asked ourselves is why focus um, shel on shelters for hurricane impact? So that we know that in cities like La Habana, um, a lot of the buildings are like basically crumbling down. Like they're super deteriorated, like no maintenance has been put into it. Like, and these are lives that, you know, like are being hurt for, from it. Like people have gotten hurt, like there have been like really bad impacts ab about this happening in Cuba. So we also thought, well, these buildings are also being affected by the weather. And a lot of times we have um, hurricanes passing by through Cuba, so that's deteriorating the structures even more, especially since there's no maintenance. So what we did was that we um, decided to go over three hurricanes. Um, the first hurricane that we chose to look at was Hurricane Niki, which happened in Hawaii. The reason we chose Hurricane Niki in Hawaii was because Hawaii, just like Cuba, is an island surrounded by water, and there's a lot of structures that are near the ocean. Like in La Habana, La Habana, a lot of the structures are near the ocean and Malico and like, you know, all of that stuff. So in Hawaii, one of the main problems was from the storm surge, the flooding. So a lot of the, the buildings and, and houses were not too, um, they weren't built high enough for like the flooding that, w that had occurred from the hurricane. Also, we noticed when overload, overload on roof systems, so a lot of the roofs just came right off. Most of the problem was due to the nailing of the roofs, um, very poor nailing. Um, the nails, some of them were corroded and it was just really bad situation. So these are like things that we take into consideration to solve for Cuba because we don't want the same thing to happen um, in Cuba. Also, wall, wall failures were caused by wind pressures. So the walls were obviously not strong enough to sustain the, the hurricane. The hurricane, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was a category four, so it impacted Hawaii. Like, they didn't see it coming. Like, it, they weren't ready and they weren't prepared. And this is what, why we're trying to make sure that Cuba is prepared for hurricanes like this also. Next. The second hurricane that we looked at was Hurricane Andrew. Um, this one was a pretty big one in Miami. Um, the wind spe it, it reached wind speeds of 160 miles per hour, so that is a lot. Um, what we noticed in um, Miami was that there was um, inadequate load transfer design, substandard workmanship, and misapplication of various materials. So we also see this happening in Cuba where people don't, like the buildings that are being built now, like which are very few, are not really being built to code or anything like that. People kind of just build whatever they like. Um, we see that a lot of people build over like homes that have been built before for like family members and things like this. So they're not really following any specific kind of code. They're just doing it as they please. So we want to, um, when we saw Hurricane Andrew, we noticed that this was also a common um, problem here in Miami where people kind of built um, illegally things and they don't really look at, into codes. So. That's why we looked into uh, Hurricane Andrew and how it impacted uh, Miami because we noticed that there's a lot of similarities with um, the way things are done here in Miami with Cuba, which I guess makes sense since it's a bunch of Cubans that come here. <laughs> um, and we apparently have a problem with following the rules. Okay, next. So then here we have a chart of the hurricanes that have passed through Cuba. Um, we noticed that here on this section, a lot of hurricanes don't seem to pass um, in the bottom, but we do notice that on this side there are a lot more hurricanes passing through there. As we see, number nine is Hurricane Charlie, which I'm going to talk about right now, and that one direct, uh, directly passed through La Habana, which is uh, our like main concern here. La Habana has the most deteriorated structures. You can change. So Hurricane Charlie was a Category Three. 
It costs more than like $1 billion um, in damage. So here we have some statistics. Um, we have 100,000, 1,100 buildings that collapsed. And I mean, these are, um, these are statistics that are given by Cuba, so it could have been that more buildings might have collapsed, because Cuba doesn't always give, you know, the right statistics, because they don't want to look bad. Um, 1,800 buildings partially collapsed, 9,000 homes with roof damage in La Habana, 5,000 in other regions. So we see that these are really high numbers um, of building collapse and, you know, buildings being damaged. I mean, look at this picture, like, this is, like, ridiculous. Like, everything just, like, fell apart. Like, there's nothing there. So we're trying to avoid something like this to happen. Yeah. So um, for this section, can you go to the next one? This is um, this is like uh, what's there available in the island, and then we do like alternative analysis. The way it works, um, we first put like we say like cost, availability, strength, sustainability, workability. Um, we gave them like a weight factor. And then we gave different numberings, like from one to five being five the best, and one like the least desirable. And then go to the next slide. Um, then these are the materials that we came out with, like wood, steel, concrete, adobe, and brick. And then we um, gave the different um, category, like the different categories, the point value. And then with the weight, um, we came up that wood has 4.05. Um, over five maximum possible. Um, and then, yeah, we, in the wood section, we pick like cross laminated panels, um, which um, for the strength uh, has very adaptable pro properties. Um, you can engineer the wood to, be, like, to make it very strong. Um, the maintenance is very low. It, it's not skill maintenance, so um, it could be easily done. Um, the workability, it's easy. People can do it in the island. They can do it in Cuba. They can do it anywhere. Um, the sustainability aspect is the most important one. Um, you can plant it. You can do the entire economic system around it. And then the availability, they are doing this in Isla de la Juventud. So the uh, Pinus Caribea is being planted there. There are like 300 acres um, that are already there in the island. So um, and all that leads to, to low cost, which I think it's the, um, the most important thing. We want to make something that is it's cheap and the people could do it. So um, this is like what we focus the most. Like we want to do something that be realistic. If it is too expensive, people are not going to be able to do it. So that's why we focus on cost, and that's why we pick wood as our desired uh, material to, to build. OK, so here's our proposed project. We consider things like the material, the location of the buildings, uh, the shape, obviously the connections, one of the most important parts in hurricane construction, windows as door and doors, and roofing. As we said before, the material we used was cross-laminated um, timber panels. And actually, Dr. Armando Perez um, was talking about leapfrogging technology, and this is one of the ways that we want to do this, because this is not a material that's been currently in use in the United States, and it's a great material. And most of the time, we think about wooden structures being only about one story high, but these can actually go much more than that. Um, they have improved dimensional stability because the mass timber panels are cross-laminated as opposed to just glued in the same direction. So it allows the wood to have strength in both directions as opposed to just in the direction or against the direction of the grain. It also increases the in-plane and out-of-plane strength and stiffness. It has two-way action capabilities. Obviously, it's way more economically and environmentally friendly than um, reinforced concrete and obviously steel. I mean. Buildings occupy like, an extreme percentage of our um, carbon footprint, and we just want to be sustainable, especially since Cuba is such a kind of blank slate. We want to be able to create a whole sustainable country that we can just start from the beginning with that, and that would be great. Fire is obviously a great concern for most people, but since these um, panels are actually manufactured, we can 
manufacture them to burn extremely predictably and slow and make them just as safe as a steel building or a concrete building. And also they have a 12% moisture contact, they're, they're kill dry to that, so fungus and, I hate this microphone, I'm sorry, can you guys hear me without this? Um, so pest and fungal attacks will not be a problem either. I don't know if you actually want to use this, this is like horrible. I think we're out of time, but can we keep going? Or oh yeah, can we go to the next slide? Yeah. Um, so when we were determining the shape and size of uh, the hurricane shelters, we decided that it be we have uh, at least thirty people in there, um, five to six families, uh, five of which are bedridden or sick, and we use FEMA standards for um, choosing the dimensions. We chose it to be a square shape because we found that simple, uh, compact, and symmetrical buildings are strongest. So um, using FEMA standards, we, we actually use five more people to, um, to account for, to be conservative for extra space in case like more people wanted to use the shelter. And um, yeah. All right. So another important aspect is of the shelter is the roofing. And so we decided to go with um, hip roofs. Um, so because hip roofs are aerodynamically more stable, the most stable roofs, because we looked into gable, but it's not as good. Um, it's also important to make sure to have. If you guys can use the microphone just for the sake of the oh. video. Oh. Okay. Um, it's also important to have low angles. Um, also, modest overhangs. Otherwise, um, what will happen was that will the hurricane will just pretty much lift up the roof. Um, next. Also, very important is the connections. A lot of people would think that it has to do with the material, but it really doesn't have so much to do with the material. It's more about how it's connected. So we need to use heavy metal gauges and lag bolts. Next. Also, in the case that we wouldn't be able to build it. Um, inland and we'd have to build it more towards the shore. Um, we'd have to use these kind of uh, piers and foundations, so the wooden posts would have to be embedded into the sediment with um, a concrete uh, pad at the bottom. So um, for the final result, um, or this is our CAD drawings, um, um, so how would the, the benefit of these shelters gonna be? Um, the benefits is entire industry that's gonna be created, the forestry industry, the wood mill um, construction, the, um, the like plywood construction is gonna be like creating economical uh, resources for the people to fund these shelters. Um, this is like what we want to, this is what we mean with sustainability. And then I told you that I was going to talk about resilience. Um, the end result of like resilience, like how, as we see it now, is like this resilience to to be together, to be able to to go and overpass these barriers, these challenges, and that's the resilience, the resilience of the people um, to keep moving forward. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm so sorry that we ran out of time and we couldn't present, but um, now it's open to questions for uh, for you. Okay. Thank you.